Okay guys, uh, we're at Sam Studio, which is Liss Moore Mastering. Um, if you saw the previous video, you would know that Sam came to our studio to cast his expert ear over our mixers, gave us some great advice and we made some adjustments and then we forwarded those uh, stereo files to Sam who has gone through the process and has mastered them in readiness for our EP. But what I wanted to do was to continue with the hard times mixing and mastering process and we want to run through today what Sam has actually done in mastering hard times. But before we get into that, um, I thought it'd be worthwhile just to um, cover a little bit as to what mastering is and who better to answer that question than uh, a mastering engineer. So Sam, what is mastering and why do we need to get our music mastered? Okay, so there's various elements in mastering really and I suppose the first thing is, is bringing it up to a consistent um, sound and level as similar music that's out there yeah. in the rest of the world. So when your listeners are listening to it, the, your music's going to present in a similar way to similar music in terms of volume, in terms of the tone, in terms of dynamics. So also it's, it's a case of getting the, um, the five tracks in this case um, to sit well together. Um, I heard it like an Ian Shepherd who's a mastering guy likens it to you know the, the mixes of paintings and as the mastering engineer you're the um, curator putting their right, paintings yeah, up, up. Yeah. So, so you're lighting them well so they show the best elements of each mix. So you're trying to pull out the best elements, you're trying to also make them sit well together. Right. So get the track spacings correct between them. So there's, so one element is like consistency across your work and pulling the best out of your work. One element's consistency across the, your work against all the other music that's out there as well. And then I think another major element is actually just that kind of quality control element of um, making sure everything's right before this goes to yeah. the world. So that's yeah, yeah. quality control in the mix process in terms of, we talked a little bit last time about translation, so knowing how your, you know, if, if your studio is bass heavy, you're going to mix bass light. Yeah. So in the yeah. mastering studio, we have a, an audio microscope, people say, so we can try and correct any of those things that got through the mix process and try and optimise your audio. Okay. And, and then just, yeah, making sure that it's all quality controlled and it's going out. Obviously in the now a lot of stuff goes out to digital and it goes out to streaming and whatever and files can be replaced but you want when it goes out you want it to be right yes, and yeah and yeah. especially if it's a physical format for instance like cd something could leave this mastering studio and then in a week's time it's a warehouse full of cds absolutely so yeah, that yeah. quality control on that le when you get to that level that quality control bit is a major part of the process okay well before we get into the kit and the kind of kit you use and why you use it um, I wanted to ask you, what, what got you into mastering in the first place? Like, a, well, I, I had a kind of more, more general sort of music and recording and production kind of role before this. Um, so I, I did a, I studied a degree in sound recording many years ago. Um, I spent a lot of time playing in bands and touring in bands, did a lot of recording. I taught a lot um, in universities in recordings, of which actually was probably the best preparation for mastering of it at all because it basically involved listening to music, listening to a lot of recordings and making judgments on how good they were or where, yeah, in which areas yeah. they were good and in which areas they weren't so good. And that's actually what you end up doing with mastering. Like you listen to it, you're trying to identify what's really good about it and pull that out. You're trying to identify what's less weak about it and yeah, yeah. push that in. So actually that was really good. When I moved up to Sheffield a few years ago and then I set up the studio here and I started just doing some mastering jobs and they started coming back and I started getting more of it and I, you know, I just started, I thought, oh, these, I see people seem to really like what I'm doing here. Yeah. And so I just thought I'm really going to focus in and I think there's a great value in really focusing in on a niche, a niche area or a specialised area. You've become, yeah, yeah. become quite useful to people. Well, when, when we received the, uh, the, the mastered versions that you've done for us, um, I'd, I'd had those for about four days and I resisted listening to them 
because I wanted to wait till the guys were around yeah, yeah. and we were in our studio uh, and we listened to, to them together for the first time and we were blown away the the quality of, of the work that you do oh, great. we're Thank highly you. delighted with so I will leave in the description below uh, Sam's details it's list more mastering the based in Sheffield but I'll put all his contact details below uh, Obviously, what we'll also do is, if you give me some playlists of some of your other work, for sure, uh, I can leave that there as well, and people yeah. can have a listen to to what you do. That would be great. So, um, in terms of the equipment, then um, let's start off with what do you run your software on, and what software is it that you use? Okay, so the software I'm using is WaveLab, um, which is it's been around a long time. WaveLab as an audio editor, yeah, but the sort of more recent oh. versions. They've, um, the more recent versions, it's gone to a very specialised mastering piece of mastering software. So you'll see on the screen here, I've got my um, audio files, which we'll look at later. But also you can do kind of track markers, you can do CD identification codes. It's also got a lot of really nice metering, metering options. So see here, we can, we can monitor, um, I'll just turn it down for a second. We can monitor level, we can monitor loudness, which can be important. We've got um, frequency based monitoring, um, various different frequency monitoring, and then also it allows us to put metadata into files, right? Um, yeah, for identification and things. So it's it's really kind of, kind of quite a specialized um, mastering solution now. And do you use plugins on this software, or yeah, do you, so is it all hardware that you use? So I use a mixture of hardware and software. Um, I'll take you through the very sort of. I have a. I'll take you through the very basic chain. Though, if you see here, this send track on the bottom. Yes. This is what people call the pitching track. This is throwing the audio out and into my desk. Yes. Um, where it goes through the hardware. Once it's been through the hardware, it comes back into this record. I call it a print track, um, or it could be a catching track, I suppose, if it's pitching. And it, we record. I record the audio after it's gone through the analog chain back into WaveLab here. And then on this print track, I also run some final plugins. Right. So things like my limiters uh, are all plugins. I think there's um, there are some really good hardware limiters, but you pay a lot of money for them. I think limiting something that can be done really well in the box. Yeah. So you see on each clip then in here, for each song. Yeah. I've got a, a plugin chain here which has got some EQ and various different EQ and compression and then limiting. Right. Um, and is that applied after you've re-recorded what's gone through the desk, or is it done simultaneously? So as I'm as I'm recording, I've been monitoring through those plugins. Right. I get, I get my setting of those plugins to where I want them to be, because obviously I might change the setting on my final digital chain that will then lead me wanting to change something on my analog chain. So, but where, where I get to the point where I'm happy, I then print in the analog audio and then copy across the um, final digital plugins onto that clip. Right. So I've, the nice thing is it means I've still got the capability then to change that final bit of processing when I put all the songs together. Yeah. And um, I've got the capability to change that processing to make all the songs sit sit nicely. Okay. So Just we, ignore my yeah, phone yeah. pinging. Um, okay, so the the outboard gear is do you go through the same chain in the same order or do you swap the patching around so you might go through an EQ before you go through a compressor or vice versa? Generally, generally my chain is fairly set up in terms of order. What I do is take bits out and put bits in. Right. As Depending on as and when I need them. Yeah, okay, so so looking at looking at my chain, it's, it's mainly EQ and compression. Right. Um, I've got this Great River MAQ2NV, catchy name. Um, it's an American company, but they base their designs on the Neve sort of 1081, 1073 sort of topology I think is the word um, with some sort of performance enhancement I think um, so yes yeah, and the, the nice thing here is the EQs are switchable right which is quite important because it means I can recall exactly if you come back and say oh, I really like the master but on X Y or Z I can recall it to exactly where it was right pretty much with the switches quite quickly and carry on so then so then I've got an, another EQ Maslek um, MEA2 real sort of mastering classic you see in a lot of mastering studios um, this would be kind of a very clean EQ, really. You can make quite big changes with this. And right. The, the, this Neve has got a kind of subtle quality to it. Sorry, the Great River has got a kind of subtle quality with the transformers and things to it. The Mastex are kind of cleaner So would, sound. Would you apply changes 
using both EQs across all frequencies or would you say well I use one predominantly to balance up the bottom end and the mass selector maybe do the mid range and upper end or yeah I have I very rarely use the, the top end on either of these I like to do that in the box um, but yeah there's something like I really like the low mid cut on this Great River I really like the really low bass because it adds some um, some sort of saturation and some harmonic information into right. it as well whereas the Maslek but if I've got something that's very saturated already I might be more tending towards the Maslek because it's cleaner yeah if I've got something that's I think needs some more saturation needs knitting together a little bit more I might be doing a little bit more work right on here but I have but often I use both of them in, in different areas um, you know depending on what what the material is really right um, the Maslek can you can do quite big change you can do very small changes that are very apparent or you, or you can do very big changes that are very subtle. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's a it's a it's a really kind of yeah it's an amazing piece of equipment. Um, so then on the compression side, so the the EQ I'd often use both. The compressions tends to be more either or. Right. Um, so I've got three comp three compression options here. Um, I've got um, this Crane Song STC8, which is the most recent edition. Um, this is Class A again, very clean compression. Um, it's got two modes of kind of Hara and Key. Hara's cleaner, Key's more sort of similar to LA2A kind of. Is that thing. a fixed knee or a variable knee compressor? That's a really good question actually. Looks well, fixed it's, knee to me. It's fixed knee, but it's got this shape which is ah. somewhere between, it's not a ratio control and it's not a knee control, it's somewhere between ratio right. and, and knee. So um, this is, yeah, it's kind of knee and kind of ratio. Right. Um, but the attack and release, I love the attack and release on here for. They're so active, they can really allow you to really sculpt things in the way you want. But again, we're generally talking about really small amounts of compression in mastering, so 1 or 2 dB. Right. Um, but I, I really, I mean, again, this is like the most recent thing I've added to the studio, but it kind of is not very technical, but it, it gives everything a finished quality. Right. <laughs> it's very hard to put your finger on. So you don't actually do much in terms of frequency compression it's, it's on the complete signal generally on the whole yeah right. generally on full range what I do have is on this one I can I've got side chain filtering so right. I can I can um, control what's triggering the compression I do do some frequency dependent stuff that tends to be that again the box. In I'll the show box. you with what yeah. I do that yeah so that's one option then this is a um, um, Phoenix mastering plus thermionic culture British company make all valve gear so this is a very new valve compressor um, the attack and release aren't as active as they are on there. They kind no. of it kind of waves around and does what it does. But it has a bit more warmth to it. Than yeah, it definitely. Yeah, yeah, it definitely gives that valve warmth or harmonic distortion. It also has an effect, kind of bringing everything forward. In that, it feels like it brings the whole frequency range forwards yeah. and makes everything present in the same way. Um, so I use that a lot. In, in the case of the master we're going to discuss today, I'm actually using this with no compression. I'm just doing two dB boost on the input, two dB. Um, yeah, I'm just doing a 2 dB boost just to get the sound of that gain, just get the yeah, sound of it running yeah, through there. Yeah. The, my third option for the um, compression is this Neve Portico, well, Neve Designs um, Master Bus Processor, the things called. So this has got a compressor and it's also got some stereo stuff. And then it's got this silk modes here, which um, they're basically tra transformer loading the signal to so right, give different yeah, harmonic. Yeah. To give, so that gives different harmonic um, variations, really. To the signal, I don't tend to use since I got the Crane Song. I don't tend to use the compressor on this one loads, but I often I use the um, the Silk setting, and then it's got some nice. You can widen the mix, but you can widen it in different frequency ranges. So right, you can, yeah, you yeah. Only widen the top end, or you can narrow the I'm bottom the, end, yeah. or um, so that's nice because. So you can, if you've got some guitars and you think I want to try and put some width on those guitars, you find it's fundamental frequency and. Yeah, yeah. So it, I mean they're fairly wide bands, but, yeah. but I often use it the high mid or low mid can just give it a little. It adds a little bit of, it kind of is a little bit like EQing in those frequencies as well, but it, it adds, yeah, and also if, especially if things are going to vinyl, you don't want the bottom end to be white, you want to get the bottom yeah. end narrow, so yeah. just you can be you can be subtler here without putting things majorly out of phase. You can kind of subtly work on the, the stereo imaging. Excellent. Um, and then I think the other thing that's really worth pointing out about the studio, other than the equipment actually, is, is metering as well. I've got the flux meters there. Yeah, they give me frequency monitoring. Oh, wow. Fre they give me frequency, loudness information. Yeah, they get also give um, phase information. So, so I see if there's any how phase coherent the left and right channels are. 
and it also gives sort of stereo information across the frequency band here as well, so we can see um, we can see how the how the stereo like we can see it's balanced left to right. We see there's not too much stereo stuff going on in the bass end here. Yeah, so you've got a lot of stereo information going on around here. I also know she's got this little monitor. What's uh, what's that monitor? So this is TC Clarity. This is called, and this is this just this is just running off what I'm hearing. Go through this meter. So this is loudness wheel here, so we can see the loudness over time. So I think when it's set, so it does it takes 10 seconds or something for the wheel to go around. So that shows me the 10 seconds of loudness. So I can set the loudness level that I'm aiming for here. Yeah. So it might be, let's say minus 14 is not what I aim for, but that's what Spotify things. And I can see how it. Yeah, so yeah. I normally know roughly where I want things to. Again, I don't tend to aim for anything. I tend to go where the music takes me. And then I'll look at this say, oh, well, minus 10 or minus 8 or whatever, that feels about right. Right. Yeah, yeah. And also, it means I can then run Spotify or Tidal, I tend to use. I can run Tidal through my speakers and see what other similar music's reading yeah. on there as well. Yeah. So, also gives us this quite a nice little stereo balance meter, it's called. So, if you've got an equilateral triangle, it shows you've got a good balance of mids but, and all right. sides. Oh, that's, that's, that's quite useful. And it gives me phase correlation. Then you can do all sorts of analysis on here. But I tend to usually have the loudness wheel showing because everything else is yeah. getting off the um, flux analyzer there. And then I, I suppose the next most important piece of kit is that panel of the speakers. So give me a bit of background on those because okay. these are fantastic. Yeah, okay, so these, these are new new to me fairly recently because I had probably my old speakers a little bit. But um, they're called Dutch and Dutch 8Cs and they're, well, they sell them as hi fi, like very high end hi fi speakers. Um, as well as um, a lot of mastering studios are starting to use them. They're, um, they're kind of new generation speakers because they, they've got DSP in them. So I'm running digital inputs into, my, into the speakers and doing the conversion in the speaker. So we've got two drivers on the front, um, but then there's also two drivers on the back of the speaker as well, which do the, the sub bass. Right. So they're a very, very full range, they're a very full range system. They're right down to, as you heard, before we started recording, they go right down to kind of 20. 20. They're, they're very full range and they kind of, they're, they're not small speakers, but they're not big speakers, but the sound of them kind of belies the uh, appearance a little yeah, bit, yeah. I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, obviously changing speakers is quite an ordeal in the mastering studio because you're so reliant on knowing what you hear. Absolutely. But I've also got this under the desk there, I've got this Trinov system, which um, is a uh, um, digital room correction. Right. Um, system which um, I've got tuned in a certain way so it, it, it makes um, I can really kind of trust the uh, what you're hearing yeah what yeah, I'm yeah, hearing and yeah. how that's going to translate into all the studios yeah well as I think we discussed in the um, previous video I don't know whether I actually got onto the edit but we had a big issue with our studio until we did a, a, a rebuild uh, during Covid and we got a big um, uh, standing wave at about 300 hertz yeah and it just destroyed all that yeah 300 is really high as well it's gonna and once we put all the acoustic treatment in it just oh the sound in that room yeah and it's not ideal because it's a square room but it made a huge difference so yeah w would you recommend the use of these types of speakers in mixing and in the recording studio or do you think they are more for mastering purposes um i think I think people probably would use these. You could use them in a studio for mi for mixing on. They're quite an expensive for solution yeah. for a studio for mixing on. Um, um, yeah, I don't. I haven't seen anybody. They're quite a new company. I haven't seen anybody using them in tracking rooms. The only thing uh, they go pretty loud. They go way louder than you need for mastering. Whether they go loud enough for what you might want in a tracking room, right? That might be the limitation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think they would. I think they would work well, and I'd imagine that they'd be fairly fairly robust. But um, I don't know if people would want them as their main. I don't think no people would want them as their main, main monitors no. in a big in a studio. No. But I also don't know if they're, they're too expensive to be near fields. Probably. I, as well. I'm I'm kind of talking more sort of mid mid size studio, not your big recording studios. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I the, the, sorry. The reason the, is that I find sometimes in our studio we don't have. The A77s are great and they give me a, a fairly wide range but it's as we were talking before, it's this not really knowing what's going on because I don't have a subwoofer yeah. in our studio. Um, 
and you kind of think well does it matter as long as you get it reasonably balanced because if it comes to a guy like you you're going to sort that out yeah. and, and that's the thing we noticed on all our tracks is how much better you did at balancing that bottom end even though you were still working off a stereo uh, file as opposed to you know the, the mix file yeah I think um the beauty of these speakers actually, without wanting to do a big Dutch and Dutch kind of sales pitch, the beauty of them is they're actually cardioid, so the directional speaker's down to 100 hertz. So they, they're they actually pretty room independent. They, they behave very well in a lot of rooms, yeah. which, really, which really helps. I think also when you have got a system that goes down low, that you can trust, you can be much less conservative in the bottom end. Right. When, yeah. you re when you're reaching around in the dark, not quite know, yeah. knowing what's there, I think the tendency is to get rid of what's there. Yeah to be overly safe yeah whereas i know what's going on down the bottom end here i can think well i'm actually going to leave some of that in i'm going to push that a little yeah, bit because yeah. it like it encourages you to be less conservative they do um, sound good Not yeah i mean I'm, I'm, anyway. I'm yeah i'm super happy with them so we kind of flip but going back to the software then yeah you said that you still do some eq and limiting what what sort of plugins do you use okay, so uh, in I'm, the software i'm using i mean so yeah fab filter um I use um, which I really like. I just think I think the interface is so great with Fab yeah, and it makes it yeah. so easy to use. Um, this is quite an unusual amount of uh, EQ. Yeah, so on here. so there must have been some reason in the mix that that was. I just think this first track was quite a lot darker in tone than the rest of the mm, tracks. So right. this was this was bringing it back up. Trying to do it in a see this is a it's starting quite low here, 4K. But it's, I, nice. I should have done another one here that starts at 1K, but um, we'll look at that in a minute. But um, yeah, it, just, it was just bringing it up. To I think that says more about my mixing ability than it. Well, and your, and your room potentially as well. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But it's, um, yeah, it was just coming out quite a lot darker than the other tracks, so I was just trying to balance it. So I think I must have added this on afterwards. So, but I really like the Fab Filter. I really like the Fab Filter Limiter as well. Yeah. Um, which is great. I use that quite a lot. Um, this is a sort of quite a specific mastering plugin, which I use a lot, this DS1 Mark III. So this was, uh, I'm never know if it's Weiss or Weiss, I think they're Austrian or Swiss. Um, this was a real sort of mastering classic. It was actually a mm. digital compressor, but it was a hardware unit for right. the last 20 years or whatever. They've recently, Softube have recently released it as a as a plugin. Uh, you know, I think the hardware unit was over 10 grand and wow. the software the software is expensive for a plugin, but 500 quid or something. Right. Wow. But so this is a this is a frequency dependent compressor. Right. So you can use it full range. Yeah. Um, or you can use it on certain portions of the frequency band. So DS1 is as it uses as a DSer. Sure. I'd often use it to control the bass end. I think in this mix I was using it to kind of just soften kind of around 1K um, a little bit. Um, just yeah, take a little bit of harshness out. So that, that gets that gets used quite a lot. Um, this is a the same company's um, mastering maximizer limiter. Yeah. Um, and then my limiter that I tend to use um, limitless. It's called DM. Well, that's a multi-band limiter then. You can choose. You can have the bands separate, right. or you can have the bands. You can have them separate, or you can have them working together. Um, I think it's because when I sometimes use is it the LL3. That was a multi-band oh, yeah. limiter. That's is that the waves one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I really like this. You can push things to be quite loud on here if you want um, as well. So yeah, DMG are a great company. They make a fantastic EQ. It's Probably a limit you wouldn't want to mess them out with if you mix in because it's. I yeah. see there's a lot of settings on it. It's quite yeah, tweaky. Yeah. Well, talking of time and tweaking, I, one of the questions I did want to ask is, roughly how long does it take? I know this would change dependent on what tracks you're mastering, but on average, how long does it take you to master a single track? What's um, I'd hopefully have it done within the hour. Right. Um, I think with mastery, you don't want to hang around too long because you, you got to kind of make sure your perception is good. You know, you, yeah, you, you get, get, get too. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to get fatigued. Or you want to get. But yeah, I mean, I generally, if I had an album in, I generally aim to master an album in a day. Right. But I'd probably listen to it the night before, have a quick listen through the tracks, kind of have an idea what where I'm going with it. Then I'd master the album in the day, and then I'd probably come back the next day and do a bit of quality check. Right. You know, the next yeah, morning, yeah, yeah. quality check, check that. I was making decisions, my decisions were as good at the end of the day as they were at the start of the day. Yeah. yeah. And then um, checking the whole thing sits together. And, and then I'd, then after that, I'd send to the clients and get their approval on the audio. And then when it comes back, I'd probably make a final, well, I will make a, then a final quality check of the, all the different formats. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, but the actual master, again, sometimes you can, some, 
Depends how good the mix is, I suppose, yeah, as well. Yeah, it does, but it's also sometimes it can be a really good mix that can take quite a long time because you're making really small, you're making small changes and you also don't want to undo any, if it's a really great mix, then it's, yeah, you, yeah. Know, it's, uh, you don't want to do any damage to it as well. So, um, so yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes like mixes take a long time because they're not so good. Sometimes mixes take a long time because they're really, really good. good. Yeah, yeah. What I wanted to do was to continue with the hard times mixing and mastering process and we want to run through today what Sam has actually done in mastering hard times. Okay guys, um, Sam and I were having such a good chinwag that this video kind of got a bit long. So be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you will know when part two comes out, where we will be getting into the detail of mastering hard times.